Let's bring in the journalist and author Janelle Aldred and the journalist and broadcaster Thomas Copeland. Thanks both again for sticking with us and for being with us again. Janelle, let's start off with the front page of the FT. You've picked out a story there about Deloitte uh, scaling back London offices in the, in the FT's words, stark sign of shift to remote working. Deloitte's one of the uh, magic circle, big four rather, of uh, accountancy firms. So why they decided to scale back office work? it seems that most of their staff have decided they don't want to come in more than twice a week and I don't think that's um, unusual in this post um, well not post COVID but post um, lockdown world where actually a lot of people are deciding they quite liked remote working and the freedom that it gave them to you know work from home be in more comfortable surroundings and also not have the commute so they've lost over 400,000 um, square foot of real estate space in central London and of course this does then create another issue for developers and also a state agents who work in these spaces. But it's also worth noting that they've done the most radical cutback of the big circle, or the magic circle, the big four, um, than others people haven't gone as far back. But with all of these, there's no job losses. This is just about a working issue. And actually, most of them are saying they have a higher headcount now, which is why they're not reducing the office space to nothing. There's more people, but more of them will be working from home more often. I've enjoyed working from home. Who wants to get on the sweaty tube in the morning? Not me. <laughs> you know, I, sh I should have a massive screen in my home, so I can't work from home. Thomas, um, what about you? I mean, what do you think about this work from home move? Well, I mean, listen, I think, you know, the UK has a really big productivity problem. It's one of the areas in which we're the lowest in the G7 tied with Italy. So uh, it, the evidence seems to point towards the idea that this sort of hybrid form of working is good for productivity. That's good for the economy, all happy. Where I have some slight concerns is I think uh, working from home really works. If you're a little bit older, maybe you've got a family at home, you've got a nice house, you've got good Wi-Fi, you've, you're living in a house that you own or perhaps your family is in, you're not sharing with other rooms. It's where I think uh, working from home is not nearly as attractive as for young people who are starting into a new industry. Often, and I don't know about either of you, often the way in which you learn early on into an industry, into a career, is those quick questions at the water cooler. It's quickly being able to ask uh, a peer, a colleague, maybe even your boss, a little tip, something that you don't want to have to schedule a whole team call in order to delve into. Those kind of relationships that you develop uh, in the office or wherever your place of work is at an early age are ones that are really valuable. Uh, and I think one of the damage, not only is it bad for young people in terms of those early stages of developing a, in a career, I'm also uh, you know, slightly concerned about the idea of big companies essentially outsourcing a lot of the, the costs that they would typically provide to young people who are already in places like London really struggling when it comes to rent. So, for example, it would have been the case that a big company like maybe Deloitte or any other one would have provided Wi-Fi, obviously, in the office. The lighting would have been paid for in the office. The heating would have been paid for in the office. Um, health and safety regulations in the office. There might have been a coffee machine in the office that you could use. All of those things would have previously been covered by the company. And now, of course, they're being exported and you've got the cost of living crisis at the moment. If you're working at home, three days a week you're going to be paying a lot more to heat the house a lot more to light the house a lot more in terms of the demands that are put on on your wi-fi and your internet service all of those things have a disproportional impact on younger people because they use a higher proportion of their income to pay for those things so i think it's often you know middle not middle managers but management in companies who are typically a little bit older maybe have a nicer home to go home to they have maybe have elderly parents need to take off family that's really attractive for them but you can't forget that you know there are young people people for whom getting into the office is really important financially but also in terms of those early stages of the career but I think you know this hybrid model can work having that hub where people can go into young people can go into maybe if they want to go three days a week maybe four rather than two but productivity is key and there are definitely days of the week when maybe you have a doctor's appointment or you have a caring responsibility that's true across young and old and allowing some flexibility there I think broadly speaking is a good idea. Absolutely right okay uh, Janelle I can see you were pulling a face there just pick up quick on some of the things you heard Thomas saying because I don't we have endless time but I do want to get through but I, I want mean, you to I respond. For me, people from Deloitte are probably um, maybe potentially not so worried about um, their gas and electric and, and bills and, and such the like, but I, I take the point, but I think it's a sweeping generalisation to talk about younger people and, and middle managers. I think it is more sector specific, what you kind of do and what your pay is as much as anything else, rather than it just being a young, old divide, but that would 
be my opinion. Appreciate you coming in with that opinion, Janelle. I've brought you in, so thank you very much for that. All right, Thomas, let's, let's pick up with you. You've got a story on the front page of The Telegraph. Um, the headline is, Volunteers on Call for 999. I had to read through the article to see exactly what they meant by that. This is fascinating. Community first responders are going to be uh, put forward. So this is people who will be picking up the slack when the ambulance service can't get to people. But this is emergency calls. That's right. It's a sign of the times. Volunteers are being sent to drive 999 patients from home to the hospital. This is coming from the London Ambulance Service. Senior doctors uh, across London warning of what they call, quote, staggering delays in terms of getting ambulances to people into A&E. This is the first time, I mean, volunteers have been a part of the health service for a longer period of time in, in a variety of forms. This is the first time that volunteers will be used for emergency and ambulance cases. Uh, but I mean, uh, already it's been fairly clear for, for people who've been watching the extent, the kind of pressure that in particular emergency care has been under in the UK. This article talks about how whilst this is the first time the volunteers have been using, the ambulance service has as a policy for an extended period of time been uh, paying for taxis taxis to take people from home to the hospital in cases of emergency. Now, in fairness, these volunteers are only being used for, I think, what they call class three, stage three, level three uh, types of patients. And that means that they're the ones for whom there's about a two hour window in which it's important to get to the hospital. So just a little bit more time. But across the board in London and the rest of the UK, the waiting times for A&E, the waiting times for amb ambulances are at record highs. I know in Northern Ireland, for example, this has been really big across the media as it happens this week. There's been a huge amount of discussion about delays in terms of A&E and GPs uh, as well. Um, horrifying and, and heartbreaking stories of people lying uh, yeah. in the street on the pavement for hour upon hour or in a hospital bed hour upon hour upon hour on end and the question that all of this leads to of course is there's a really big financial element to this and the government of course claims that it is uh, paying the nhs uh, the you know the funding is at record highs other people disagree one of the big problems i think also though is this question of accountability one of the attractions of nationalizing an industry in the way that health is nationalized in the uk is meant to be you know who to hold to accounts. But of course, there are so many different layers now and entities that are responsible for different parts of the health service. In this example, there's a London Ambulance Service. There's, of course, NHS England, mm -hmm. GPs, there's local GP practices. Is it your council? Is it your local or nationally elected politicians? Is it MPs in Westminster? I think what would be helpful as well as yeah. more clarity on funding is that question of who do you hold to account? Absolutely right. Okay, Thomas, um, thank you for that. Janelle, let's uh, pick up on one of your other stories. Let's go to um, the one in The Guardian. Double summer is how my producers describe it. This is an idea to uh, increase, uh, change the clocks, basically, isn't it, Janelle? Just explain what it is. Yeah, not double summer. We'd all love that and um, double the time of sunshine. But what it is, the Liberal Democrat peer says that we should move to Paris times, so that we get more evening daylight to cut the cost of living. So with inflation at the highest in 30 years, what he's saying is if in the summer we move the clock two hours ahead of um, Greenwich Mean Time, and in the winter it was an hour ahead, 11 months of the year we'd actually have more daylight in the evenings. Now, I think some people would welcome, I mean, so many times over the years we've heard this about putting the clocks forward. The last time it was done was in the Second World mm. War, so it was in a time of great national emergency. So who's to say that it's not the answer now um, for um, cutting the cost of living and especially heating in the evenings and light? Yeah, let's hope that makes a difference. As someone who has to go to bed at like seven o'clock, not too happy about being so bright when I go to bed, but whatever, it's not my issue. All right, Thomas, Janelle, thank you so much, both of you, this morning, and uh, happy Easter. Have a good one. See you soon. All right, well, still to come on Sky News Breakfast, more on that missile attack on the rest of Ukraine, where six people are now sent to have died.